Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Hear the word of God. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight, and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. The second reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 6 to 26. Again, hear the word of the Lord. Jesus is praying. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I come from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that these also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me, before the foundations of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and those know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. After the descended into hell line in the creed, the article that seems to cause the greatest amount of confusion for people is, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. 
This is, of course, understandable because the last time any of us checked, and I realize that it's been about a month since you've probably seen it, but I personally guarantee you that it's still on the sign. Our sign out on the highway says Presbyterian on it. And Presbyterian, especially historically, means definitely not Catholic. So it can seem weird, to say the least, that just about once a week, we Presbyterians say that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And not just Presbyterians, lots of different kinds of Christians say they believe in the Holy Catholic Church. It's weird. And while we're being critical about this phrase, let's tackle the other adjective too, holy. Holy. I mean, we generally try, I know, but I've seen too much of the news, I've read about too many scandals, I've lived through too much church-caused heartache to be able to say with absolute and heartfelt conviction that the church is holy. And I bet it's the same for most of you. It might, at first, seem like a helpful answer to say that Catholic, as the adjective that is used in the creed, isn't referring to the Roman Catholic Church, you know, the organizational body that's headquartered in the Vatican and led by the Pope. The dictionary definition of just the word Catholic means universal. So when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, we're not saying that we believe in the Roman Catholic Church. That would be a little silly anyway, like saying that we believe in the color blue. The existence uh, of the Roman Catholic Church is independently verifiable. You don't need to make a creed about it. What we're saying is, I believe in the universal church. But that's a bit of a pinch too, isn't it? Our problems don't just go away with some clarification of vocabulary. Actually, saying it as universal might make it even more of a problem. I did a little Googling this week. There are a little over 40 Presbyterian dominations in the United States by itself. There are nearly 200 Protestant denominations in the United States. And when you start to look at the number of churches of all stripes that exist globally, the number swells to the tens of thousands. It's really hard to track down, but it's a lot. So, with that in mind, all the descriptors that we might think to use for the church in the world today, if we made a list of them, universal, or unified in any sense, really, might be one of the last things that we come up with. And yet, every Sunday, here it is in the Creed. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. It's in the Nicene Creed, too, so when we switch to that one, we don't get away from it. And when we really think about it, that line might start to stick in our throats. Unified in what way? When we get to this point of frustration with the creed, whether it's with this line or any of the other ones, it's helpful to remember that the creed isn't intended to be recited or read by itself in isolation. There's a reason that in our services it always comes after the sermon, after the scriptures have been read and hopefully explained. The creed never stands on its own. And today, maybe one of the scripture texts the people who wrote the creed might have had in mind is this long, beautiful prayer of Jesus's that we have in John 17. I really encourage you sometime when you've got a few minutes to yourself. I don't know, maybe you can't leave the house for some reason. But when you have a few minutes, sit down and really meditate on this prayer. I think it's one of the most powerful bits of scripture that we've got. Jesus is about to die, about to sacrifice himself for the life of the world. And right before he does that, he takes the time to say this long, beautiful prayer specifically for you. Look again towards the end of the prayer. He's prayed for himself, he's prayed for his immediate disciples, and then he prays for you. 
Father, I ask not only on behalf of these, meaning these disciples who were right here with him, who followed him around on earth and were eyewitnesses to what he did there, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. Those who will believe in me through their word, that's you, that's us, that's powerful. We might get a hint here in Jesus' prayer about the state of the early church. We modern Christians have a habit of nearly idolizing the early church. They were the real believers, we think. They were the ones who were willing to suffer or even die for their faith. They were the ones who could remember Jesus in the flesh. They were the ones who shared all their stuff in common and really practiced their love. We have a long history of trying to figure out exactly how they did things and imitate it. A lot of the fights between churches have been who is most like the early church. We look at ourselves, or maybe more likely our opponents in the church, and think that in comparison to us or to them, the modern church is, or the early church was much more impressive. Jesus must really be disappointed in us or in the people we don't like. But here's the thing. If Jesus is praying for the unity of his disciples, if he's praying for their witness, if he's praying for their perseverance, then one, they must not have necessarily had those things, at least in the perfect measure that we like to imagine. And two, he must have had a sense that we'd be facing struggles here in the present and throughout our whole history. He must have known about the temptations to earthly political power. He must have known we'd be facing the dangers of being the persecuted and also the persecutor. He must have known that we'd be facing the dangers of the lion and the stake and also the dangers of the Inquisition and the Crusades. He must have known that we would have theological disagreements, geographical isolation, all the things that divide us and set us against each other. And in the face of it all, this is his prayer, that we may be one as he and the Father are one, that we may be made holy in truth, that together, those who believed first in Jesus's Sorry, those who believe first in Jesus and those of us who have come to faith through their testimony may together be where he is, be one with him. Neither space nor time separate us. We can't always see our unity. It's obscured by things we can't help, like distance or time or pandemics that separate us all into our homes and prevent us from gathering. It's also obscured by things that we should be striving hard to fix, like differences in belief and practice or interpersonal dislike. If our unity were obvious, maybe we wouldn't have to put it in the creed. But it's true anyway, because none of those things were what bound us together in the first place. Together, we are the Catholic Church, not because of who we are, but because of who God is and what God has done. Our unity is based on God's call, based on God's claim on us. Jesus puts it this way, that we are those whom God has given him from the world. We are one because the God who has claimed us is one. We are one because our trust in Jesus, which has been passed down through generations of believers and passed across continents and across the whole world, binds us together in ways that no division can really, truly, finally break. In the same way, Every time we say the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, we say that we believe the church is holy. It's the holy Catholic or universal church. And that's true as 
well in the same way and for the same reason that the church is universal, not because of us, but because of God. The church is not holy because we have achieved perfection. There's no point in trying to say that it is. Living in the same world with the church is enough to demonstrate that it's just not true. It's clear that the holiness of the church, if it has it, is not something the church has achieved itself. Just like it's clear that the church's universality is not something that we have achieved and get to boast about. The church is holy because God has set it apart within a world that doesn't know him. It's holy because he intends to use it a little like he used the burning bush and the land around it. When Moses approaches the burning bush, God says, Take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. But the ground and the burning bush isn't important in and of itself. It's just a bush. It's just some ground. But it was holy because God was using it to bring news of freedom and redemption to Moses and to the people of Israel. In the same way, the universal church's holiness isn't something it has in itself, but it's something that it has because God has graciously chosen it uh, to use it for the good of the world, use it to bring God's good news into the world. It's a holiness, we might say, ad hoc for this, for God's purpose. We're holy because we are God's, and God is holy, and God has chosen to use us for his own holy purposes. The church is universal and holy because the one God has called it forth in all its different manifestations for one purpose, to bear God's great good news to the world that he has made and loves. One last thing. We can't separate our affirmation of the Holy Catholic Church with our affirmation of the communion of the saints. You can see that in Jesus' prayer, too. You can see it in how he identifies us when he begins to pray for us. We are those who have come to believe in him through the witness of those first disciples. That faith acts as a lifeline, extending through time and space and tying together people who have lived and in some cases died in vastly different circumstances to one another. That, that faith ties together people who otherwise have nothing in common. And everybody relies on that faith, relies on each other to give each other that faith. When we're born... When we're baptized, we, we are, especially those of us who are baptized as children, but really everyone who's baptized, when we baptize someone in our church, we promise that we're going to be there for them, that we're going to teach them about God, that we'll witness to them about the gospel, especially as children, but even as adults. We can't know the gospel apart from each other because God's people, our, God's church, is how God has chosen to give that gospel to the world, give that gospel to each of us. When we recite the creed, then, when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, we affirm our unity with Christians in many times and places who have also recited that creed and taught its contents to us. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't know God. It's never me and Jesus. It's always us and Jesus. And nothing can break that us. Not our sin, not our divisions, not a pandemic, not even all the forces of evil and hatred that come from outside of us and within us. And that, friends, is good news. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we could ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen.